So this is special RAL M cubed uh, joint seminar. So I'm very happy to have John Pesh and Chris Short is in the background. Raise, raise your hand, Chris, and he's here too. And John will tell you about what he he does. Um, John, the title of John's talk is Regional Modeling System, but it's really a kilometer scale modeling, one to four kilometers. Uh, how many of you were at Christoph Shore's seminar last Thursday? About half the room, and this is a nice continuation of that discussion that Christoph introduced us to last week. So I consider these two weeks sort of the kilometer scale modeling weeks of uh, NCAR um, this summer. So really, uh, this is really exciting for me because we're doing similar work in the water system program. Um, John is head of a new group on regional modeling, and I'm sure he's going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, but this group has just formed, and it includes both weather and climate modeling. If you guys know Lizzie Kendon's work on uh, kilometer scale climate modeling, he's uh, working with her um, on this new in this new initiative. Um, I wanted to say a few things. Uh, John got his degree at University of Reading, and so not too far down the street from the Met Office. He joined the Met Office in 1997, um, but before joining the Met Office, he was a visiting scientist at NCAR CGD for two years. So he knows NCAR, and part of the reason he's here is to continue that uh, that linkage and collaboration. So we're hoping that we'll end up with a nice collaboration as a result of all of this visit. Um, after the seminar at about noon, we're going to schedule uh, visits with John to, for tomorrow. So this afternoon, John's, John and Chris are going to go to NOAA, have some more discussions. But we're going to um, schedule visits this afternoon. So if you'd like to, to visit with John, uh, uh, come see us after the seminar up here, and we'll, we'll get you on the schedule. And uh, Tuesday is when – this is probably Stan Benjamin, yes? <laughs> and Stan Benjamin is, and, is uh, coordinating the NOAA side. <laughs> hey, Stan, one second. <laughs> So that was perfect timing. And we're going to have a dinner at Under the Sun tonight, and Stan was just calling with the time, so I'll find out the time by the end of the seminar. Um, and I think that's it. So, John, Thank you. welcome. So thanks, everybody, for coming down. Uh, great to be back. <laughs> I've been back once or twice in the last 20-odd years. Um, so the title of this is Developing the Systems in Partnership. One of the, my other roles is I look after uh, the science partnerships of the Met Office. I think not just this, but all the science that's required for weather and climate is, is very big. It's, you can't do it on your own. It's, one centre can't, can't manage this. And so we take very, very seriously the development and how to manage and working with others to, to, to get the most out of that. And so the, my other role, which, which I'll be stopping soon just to run this group, has been over the last five or six years, has been coordinating our partnerships. And some of that I try and reflect in the talk. But I, 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 you know, I, I don't, I'm not naive enough to think that we can just develop a good regional modelling system without working together. I think that's a, the key thing there. Hmm, let's try a different plan. There we go. Sorry. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the... Actually, there's a couple of fun slides at the start. Uh, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about the Met Office and the science it does, uh, what's in our science programme, the modelling systems we use and how we try and have some of, our, some of the partnerships we have that help do that, and then move on to the developing of the regional modelling system what we use it for, the process for development, and some of our current and future challenges. And then if, if there's time, I've got some slides. We just recently did a little bit of work doing some modelling connected with the UK 2018 heat wave. Now, I put heat wave in inverted commas because I don't think it got this hot. Um, we have a different definition of heat wave to you. Okay. But it was hot for the UK, and I'll touch on that. 
Over 60 Fahrenheit. <laughs> we can't go with that. Okay, so a, a potted slide of the, the Met Office. So we, it was founded by this chap you can see on the left, uh, Admiral Fitzroy, in 1854 after a huge storm sank a ship and lots of, there was lots of deaths and he thought that there might be an opportunity here for trying to save lives. Uh, and a few years later, he'd managed to reconstruct this chart of what he thought might have been happening in, in that, that had led to that incident where, where there was those many deaths. And it grew from there into, a, into, a, an, into an increasing activity. Then one of the people that took over in 1922, Lewis Fry Richardson, <laughs> he, he's quite famous because he had the idea that you might be able to forecast the weather... Uh, using compute, well, using <coughs> equations, solving the equations of motion, and this was before computers, really. So he, his idea was that there was a big group of people with slide rules and things that all ran talking to each other and telling each other the answers. So pretty much a computer of these days, a massively parallel computer. Um, obviously, we've proved him wrong since, but uh, then in the 1949 was our first televised weather forecast. In 1959, we got our first computer. There's a picture of that down in the, in the bottom left. Climate became more of an increasing thing. And in 1990, we have a, our climate division, we tend to sometimes call the Hadley Centre. It's a name just people recognise. It's just, just climate research we do in the Met Office. And that was open in, 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 the in, in 1990. And then we celebrated in 2011, 150 years of forecasting I put a box over one. It's, it's, it's in our history, but we don't like to talk about it. In, in 1987, there was this uh, weather forecast. Well, it got a bit windy down in the south of the UK, and uh, we got heavily criticised because in that weather forecast, he said, I've had a phone call saying there's going to be a hurricane. Well, you're all right. It's not going to be too bad. And it was one of the biggest storms that went across the southern UK. So we, we, we refer to those now as a forecasting bust. We still sometimes get them, but they're much, much rarer. <laughs> Just one last thing then. That it's, so this was quite a well-known weather forecast in 6th of June 1944, where this chap on the right was given a requirement to uh, provide a day in which um, it had to be a day that was one day before and four days after a full moon. Uh, needed quiet weather followed by three further quiet days. Winds less than force three and force four. You can read those, but basically that was a, one of the most important forecasts that was done, and, and, and that was when the D-Day landings took place. Yeah. So what do we do as a National Met Service then? What, what summarises what we do? Well, <coughs> you know, in a, in a snapshot from a, the Met Office's role is, um, and you'll recognise all of these from... from, from, from the things that uh, the National Weather Service here do, uh, although we do the climate as well. So we, we, we provide climate advice and services to government, so everything they need to know around the climate. They make decisions. We don't make the decisions, the government decisions, but they base that on the advice and modelling that's done within the Met Office. We provide... We have forecasters based on the frontline military who are providing uh, forecasts based on our modelling systems for all conflict... Um, forecasts and warnings for the Coast Guards. Well, one of the two, along with Washington, the two forecasting centres that provide the wins for the flight planning of all aviation around the world. And I guess most importantly, we try and warn people of extreme weather so they can plan their activities and not die is quite important. And so this, this top line is, I guess that's, I, this, this isn't a strap line, I just wrote that down, but it's, 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 it's had words like that in various strap lines at times. But I mean, it is saving lives, livelihoods and costs. So you save quite a lot of money for your country if you can save people's lives or their livelihoods as well. So everything's about saving money. So when people are trying to put proposals in for funding to do these things that make money, down the line. Actually, what you've got to recognise is it's harder to sell it this way around, but when we're putting proposals into government, we can save them more than anybody else can make by doing this improvements in these kind of advice. <clears throat> Just
just this is the last one on this, but just so I've set the scene. There's about two thousand people work for the Met Office, so it's not as big as NOAA or, or something. We're obviously a smaller country. We have about fifteen hundred people at Exeter HQ, um, as well as fifty other manned locations around the world, and about twenty eight of percent of that those two thousand people. This changes, and this slide might be a year old. Uh, in the science and research area. They're the people that are doing the research into observations and into modelling and how to use those and developing the modelling system. So that's that's the area that I sit in, Chris sits in, um, and we're doing that. I'll, I'll probably have another slide with a bit more detail in there. So what, what does the main modelling systems we use look like? So we have this kind of term. It's, it's, we call our model a unified model. It's It's called that in the sense that we use it for both weather and climate. It's the same code. There are pragmatic decisions made around whether you choose how you set it up, but we don't. We, we try and keep it deliberately as similar as appropriate for all the different things we do, which is both regional, global, weather, climate. Everything we can keep the same we do. If we make... I think there's a term traceable. I think that's probably the most important one. That's, this is why this is useful to do, is that when we can sort of describe the differences between any of the systems that have been used for anything, they've all started from the same point. But they're not identical for the different things, and I'll show that in a moment. So these are the... What I would describe as kind of operational. These are the, Operational is more of a weather term, but I've got the climate modelling things on here at the moment. So we run a global model, starting in the bottom left of this slide, really. We run a global model at, uh, it's got a 10 kilometre grid length uh, in mid-latitudes at least. We, we, we still have a lat-long grid at the moment. So actually we're, we're super resolving the poles, which isn't great uh, and somewhere something we're moving away from hopefully in the near future. But we have about a 10 kilometre grid. It's run four times a day out to different lead times. The longer ones are seven days. Uh, and we, in addition to that, four times a day out to, again, seven days, run an 18-member ensemble with a 20-kilometre grid length. So that's our global weather forecasting systems. Is that, is that coupled? That is that's a good question. That is not coupled at the moment. It's due to be coupled in about a year. Okay. So we plan to do coupled ocean atmosphere forecasting across timescales sure. in, in about a year's time. It's, it's running now in research mode. Sure. It's a real-time looking at the results. It, it's, it's decent. When we begin coupled, so we do ocean forecasting. One of the reasons we would choose to do this is that we do ocean forecasting. So I haven't really talked to I think I've written down the bottom of here, look, no. This modelling system, I'm not referring to all the ocean modelling we do. I'm not referring to the dispersion modelling and some other types of systems. This is more around the kind of, let's call it weather-based loosely uh, in terms of these systems. And one of the reasons we would choose to do coupled uh, modelling is the potential benefits for weather, but also we need to run the ocean anyway. So some of our partners, and I'll talk about that, don't necessarily do ocean forecasting, so it might not make sense to them because the benefits on the five- to seven-day lead time are... Definitely visible, not huge, and the cost can be quite, in, quite significant. So that's a decision people need to make. In that, we use that model to drive, getting towards the type of work I do, uh, a one and a half kilometre grid length model over the UK. That's run every hour. So this is really important to us. So it gives the forecasters a constant refresh on the forecast, essentially. So twice a day goes out to five days, um, but it's run every hour out to at least 12 hours. And so it hasn't always got, as you might be able to, anyone that can do sums, we're only running the global four times a day, so it hasn't always got fresh driving conditions, but there is uh, you know, 4D VAR data assimilation in the global model, so it's bringing in new observations. So that's, that. Uh, I think... Sometimes people talk about rapid refresh and things. It, it, it's giving you a, a, a more up-to-date. And um, we're trying to get away from the forecast. So we call our forecasters operational meteorologists, and we're trying to get away from the, I, them having work plans where they're waiting for models to come out. They should just have something that's there that they look at at the time they need to look at it. That's the point of that, that frequency. And any more to say on that? Oh, yeah, and an 18-member... Four, four times a day we run an 18-member lagged ensemble. So what actually happens to, to, to generate that is basically every, 
every hour we also run three models at 2.2 kilometres out to five days. And so over a six-hour period, you can build up a lagged ensemble. And that is the real product that we're hoping is the main one that's used in forecasting because there's quite a bit of uncertainty at the convective scale. So the deter deterministic models are of marginal use, although I'll get onto some problems. I'm talking really slowly, I'm just conscious. So we do regional climate modelling. We've done it over the UK and elsewhere. We do multi-year clim uh, climate slices. We try to avoid doing regional climate modelling at grid lengths much longer than about two to four kilometres. So we don't really do regional modelling at the kind of 10 kilometres because we have a global model that does that. For climate, you might want to, but we've just tried to stay out of that space as much as possible. CMIP, uh, we current CMIP 6 is a kind of latest of, of, of globally, mainly global stuff there. And that we've run, a, we have extra levels in the vertical and the global they are to better capture the stratosphere. And it's obviously coupled then, it's, we, we, our default CMIP is a 60 kilometre, this is how, how the model was developed, and a quarter degree ocean. And then we have a special lower resolution one that others can use and is for some of the more cost in intensive CMIP activities. And then finally, we run a seasonal system, which is a quarter of a degree ocean uh, and a 60 kilometre grid length. And we run out to seven months twice a day and run two hindcasts twice a day. And we're constantly evolving the hindcast and the forecast in the seasonal system. Um, it's probably beyond the scope of things I'm saying here, so I won't go into that much more. This animation on the left is, is just uh, from a couple of regional climate modelling simulations that's done, and you can see the global model will output around the edges of the white domains and then the, the, the evolution into the... Uh, when, when you become more at the kilometre grid scale and the convection becomes increasingly done by the resolved grid. You can see a lot of interesting things in this. Some of them you might not like. I don't, but they are... You know, you, you are beginning to capture some of the kind of important processes around uh, the African easterly wave areas and the propagations of things in from the, there. And these, th those are the runs I'm showing there, but UK CP18 has just been released. Oh, he's going to be released in 20... It's called 18 because that's when the, it was designed, I think, and it gets released in sept September 2019, and there we've used... 2.2 kilometre resolution from the UK with 12, a 12 member ensemble uh, driven by, uh, actually they put a regional model around, a 12 kilometre regional model to sit inside the 60 kilometre uh, climate model to drive those. And it's got various time slices, so they're 20, there's three 20 year time slices, each with a 12 member ensemble, and those runs are all complete and the analysis is going on in the report being written, and that's that's basically a service to government on this um, under these UK climate projections. Most countries have this responsibility to provide this kind of information to, to their government on climate change. Uh, the, 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 these runs that we're hoping to give us, you know, it's been marketed that they're going to be better estimates about hourly extremes. Often in the older climate regional modelling, things were more about daily daily means, and we're really breaking it down into the sort of hourly like data in terms of that analysis. Another activity we've been involved in through something called the Newton Fund, which is a collaborative activity. So part of our science partnerships is working with other countries in Southeast Asia, and we're also working in Africa. And uh, so we run regional modelling systems in other parts of the world. And I'll touch on that because we have two configurations of our regional model at the moment because we can't get one to work in two regions yet, but that's desperately, definitely something we intend and, and, and are trying to do. Uh, so we've been running over uh, Southeast Asia in real time for quite some time now over this domain and for a few months a year we also run an ensemble so that big whole area is run at 4.4 kilometers over southeast asia and then over malaysia and indonesia and the philippines we have one and a half kilometer models that are not nested in in that four kilometer grid but actually running directly in the global although we've looked at the sensitivity of both of those So I said I wanted to touch on partnerships quickly. So one of the key partnerships and, and probably relevant to discussions that crop up is um, 
we, we have the Unified Modelling Partnership. So these are different countries who are part of what we would describe as a consortium who are using the, uni, uh, the, the Unified Modelling System for their operational work in weather and climate. Mm. So providing real-time services. They're, within the country, they're mostly national met services, but not entirely. And so you'll see various countries in here. Singapore is hard to see because it's so small, but they're one of the partners in this. Uh, one of the things you'll see is the US coloured in. So the US, the US Air Force are one of our partners that, um, that, that are using it. Mainly at the moment, just a global modelling system, but want to get towards using the regional modelling system as well. And I know they've got very strong links with NCAR too, so that's one of the angles in which, which we're doing. And this partnership works, so the code's there, we're all using the same code. We release science versions that each each country can use, and the thing we get back from a Met Office perspective is all the sort of evaluation in the different regions, which is really valuable to us. But that only works because we, we use a lot of the... So it, there's a kind of membership fee which we all pay into this, including the Met Office, which funds essentially all the work that's required to coordinate it. And so... There's, a, it, there's basically an operating budget of a million pounds for the partnership, and most of that goes into either a team I have which supports the partners in making sure the model's configured right, or basically having collabor collaborative science meetings. So we spend a lot of the money having bringing the, bringing the people that are doing things together to talk about various things. One area we do that, and I know Jimmy's been to, to one, is on regional or kilometre grid scale modelling. Uh, we've had two or three, and we potentially in, in, in early days, maybe the next one's going to be in the US uh, at the end of January and uh, involving extra partners beyond just, just involved in the UN. But that's, that's really key key partnership for the Met Office. We also have some national ones, so working with universities can be quite difficult and the way we've come about this is to pin down four key universities that are really critical to us. Uh, and we fund... Uh, a joint chair, so a, a professor in each of these universities who has a role to coordinate their research across their portfolio. They work quite closely with me and, and people in the Met Office, so we have groups that, that organise it. Lots of joint PhD students, uh, each one's identified key science areas they're delivering to, and we have staff, Met Office staff, based in each of these universities. In particular, my regional modelling team has got a specific group in the University of Reading and strong links with Leeds in particular. And then there's a, something called NERC, which is a Natural Environment Research Council. They fund much of the university. I guess it's kind of a bit like your NSF. Uh, apart from it, it has these joint centres as well, which might be a bit like NCAR, I suppose. Um, they, they fund a lot of the university research. We operate a joint aircraft with NERC. Uh, we share... We, we, we have... One of the ways that helps working with the universities is we partition some of our supercomputer that we use for forecasting to be allowed to be jointly used by the universities. And so we can, we've, it's not so much about having the CPU time as having tight control on being able to make sure you're doing the same runs and things like that because all the code's going in into the same way. And so that's a really effective facility for us and that's jointly funded by NERC and but it's used by the universities but jointly funded by NERC. We have an aircraft and some ground-based observations for research that we operate <coughs> together. We also jointly developed our global Earth system model. So the Met Office produces what we'd call a physical climate model, like atmosphere, ice, ocean, land. Then to bring in all the sort of ocean biogeochemistry and the carbon cycle is a collaboration with the NERC centres, and that all gets brought in. And the development of our next-generation dynamical core, which is moving us away from the lat-long grid... Uh, was done in collaboration with the universities as well. And I know in the early days with collaboration with NCAR. When you were doing, so you may think, why, why am I showing you what we structure ourselves like in the matter of a science area? When you work with partners, it's really valuable to just see how they, this, one, one of the big thing I learned in science partnerships actually is when you're working with people, is, is, if you see how they structure themselves, you kind of know who you're talking to. Um, so science partnerships cuts across the whole. We divide ourselves up into climate, they're delivering the climate services, whether they're delivering the weather services, it's got the data assimilation research in there. As a regional modelling group and a global modelling group down here, we draw in the observations and parameterizations into the model. 
uh, and the dynamics. And we pass, you know, we're, we're delivering to this group uh, the modelling systems for climate and to the, this group the modelling systems through the research to operations team, the, the modelling systems for weather, essentially. So that's the concept of foundation science. And science partnerships cuts across it all, so I, I look after this and, and now that. Okay, I think we're all right on time. Before you go too much further, I always think it's like nice to ask um, something about regional models. And, and so the question is, well, why do we need regional models? Why are we using them? And so I've got I've got my answers to the. You could start by. I, I won't do a question and <laughs> answer session, but I'll show you my my answers to this in a moment. My thoughts on this, uh, but it. it if you don't start with that question, then you might not do the right things in developing them. And I think it's a really valuable exercise to go away and do. So, so why, do we, why do we do it? So, so these are my thoughts. So we, it explicitly represents more processes or more of a process on the, the resolve scale, especially you know, on the grid scale, especially deep convection. That's really important. That's at, at, at the state we're in at the moment with the convection schemes we have, that's effectively the most important thing that we do. Uh, but the higher resolution allows us to provide more detailed weather information. And that is useful because it does have skill. And I think it has skill because of the interaction between, let's say, detailed topography and, and the resolved processes, essentially, which are controlling where things occur. And of course, you could do that all in a global model, but we're not got a big enough, we haven't got a big enough computer. And that's, that's my answer to why we have a regional modeling system. I asked the same, we can ask the same question to a, a meteorologist, a forecaster. Uh, this is how they answer it. It's, 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 they're all aligned to, to my answers. Their, their answer is better captures the timing of the diurnal cycle of convection. Land sea breeze formation is good. That we, we, we've demonstrated we can predict, not all the time, but on occasions, better rapid intensification of tropical cyclones. Uh, and it gives a good indication of local extreme rainfall. When I asked, they gave me an equal long list of cons as well. <laughs> so I, I haven't listed those there, but just to know that you know the, they consider the global model and the use of ensembles really important in the forecasting system and wouldn't go without the global model in, in what they're doing. This is just a, a, a actual example of what I'm describing. I don't think I, I really need to show, but this is, this is over uh, Indonesia, which is one of the regions I was talking about, was modelling this GPM on the left there. We've got our one and a half and four kilometre from that grid I showed you earlier, just zoomed in on that region. The, the domains are much bigger than that. And you can see the structures and scales that you capture. And you can see examples of good things. You can see examples of bad things. But you can't see anything in the regional model that's as bad as our global model, um, which is, is, is maybe a poor example, but the convection schemes you know, really do struggle, especially in this region, with capturing the land, sea, contrast in terms of convection. And it really isn't just our global model that does that. OK, so then the next slide is... Uh, this, I, I, I presented this first in Indonesia, so they're, they're, I didn't use US ingredients. I guess it'd be burgers and stuff, but... Um, <laughs> these, these, these are the ingredients they use in Southeast Asia And when I first showed this slide. So the, these, these are what I would describe as... And, and the, it's worth going through the, 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 the ingredients of a good... This was designed for weather forecasting, so climate... I added this afterwards, but you know, I think the list is pretty much the same for climate, but... The priorities are somewhat different. This is always typical of, of when you think about weather and climate separately and what you're trying to achieve. Although weather, you know, climate now is all about understanding changes in high impact weather, I think. So don't underestimate this bottom one. It's a big box for plenty of reasons, but a regional model is really only as good as the global model that's giving it its driving conditions and, and, and potentially its initial conditions, depending on how you're doing the data assimilation and initialization. Full stop. We I haven't got any slides in here, but I can show you that we can make not in not in substantial changes to the regional model and their far smaller impacts on forecasting skill than changing the global driving model that's used, that, that's that's running it. So bear that in mind. It makes my job less important, I guess, if I'm developing the regional model. But actually understanding that is my role. Can't do anything without some observations in there, either for initialization or minimum evaluation if we're developing it, because how can we develop it if we don't know whether it's right or wrong and what we need to make better? Um, 
also we need good initialization methods. If we're not doing DA, perhaps we're doing some other thing that I'll touch on. I think if some ensembles are, are critical in this to understand the risks to things and then the tools to interpret all this to provide to the forecasters. I want to say more on that. So these are the tools, that, 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 they were the important ingredients. These are the tools that you might want to use to, to, um, to, to, to do this. So you can't get very far without... A, quality in this sense is a kind of software engineering term almost, but a quality process for managing model and model upgrades and things like that. You've got to, you've got to know what your model is, what's in it, exactly what people are using. There's no, one of the things we learned early in the UN partnership was you know, the whole point was everyone was evaluating things with their model, with our model, the, the partnership's model, but everybody got different configurations of it. it it's, it's, if you can't, haven't pinned down that the code's identical, it's, it's almost worthless. It's, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's, it's almost. Effective diagnostic tools and methods for robust evaluation of the performance. We, not only do we need to be able to say that the model was that, how do we evaluate it? How do we get those bits of things? What are the test beds and mechanisms? Can't do that without the observations. We need case studies. We need, uh, we call them uh, verification trials when they've got the full DA in and things like that. We need to understand the driving model, as I talked about in the initial conditions, and again, the tools. And none of this works without, and I've got forecasters in here as well, so when you're working on the weather scale, there's not much use the scientists saying the model's good if the forecaster doesn't believe you. You've got to engage them in the development of it. They've got to actually believe that the model's better for what they want. Otherwise, you go, look, here's our metrics, and they go, and then, so, so then you need a co coordination of that. You need to coordinate with the meteorologists. And as I've already said, this needs to be in partnerships. So, you know, partnerships don't just function. You need a collaborative framework to make them work. And that's what we've done in the UN partnership. So the role of, the role of Ahmed, I've tried to, don't try and read all the boxes. Just, just shut your eyes. Uh, uh, you know, the job we've got is we've got to understand development needs. Where, where are they coming from? And what I mean by that is for the things that the model's been used for, such as climate and weather and the different uses of those, we've got to understand, my team's got to understand where it's not good enough what, what, and then prioritise that. What's the prioritised list of how the model needs improving? This isn't saying, oh, you need a new dynamical core. This is saying the rainfall is never good over this point of the country or something like this and also feeding into that as we're doing our experiments we'll get an idea of some of the processes that are well represented and we'll want those on our list of priorities to get that you know we have to carry out performance assessments and we do that for two reasons one is acceptance so we cannot release a model that makes things worse into the into the into the world let's call it. So we've got to go through all these activities to make sure, and metrics to understand the verification, evaluation, and within that is the meteorologist, the forecaster's feedback. We've got to get that in there, otherwise it's not, it's not sufficient. Let's not forget the development work, the development of new schemes, dynamics, physics, uh, and other activities. Don't underestimate the role of I call this ancil and this is ancillaries, but this is this is the sort of boundary information. This is this is land use type land, land just a boundary condition land. I always like to say, but 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 it's so easy to well, it's, land people don't underestimate the importance of land, <laughs> <laughs> and there's plenty of them knocking around to tell you all the time. But it, and it, it really you don't have to do this for long to realise the importance of of, of capturing uh, the topography right, the land use right. Over Australia, one of the things that they discovered with our model when they were running it in forecast mode was that our trees are different to their trees. They have little stumpy trees in Australia. <laughs> and our, it, it, was, it was upsetting the forecast, basically. We gave them our trees and it didn't work well and that's all wrapped up in that kind of area there. They needed to upgrade to have Australian trees and they got better forecasts. That's all got to get pulled into the model and so there's a big cycle going on. And then, you know, NCAR are great at this and we're, 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 one of the things we can talk about maybe this week is to, to do all that bit up there, there's all these tools and things. And again, it's easy to underestimate the importance of tools and things, but you can't do anything. So you've got MET, which is, a, 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 I think we've got something called Toolbox, which isn't as good as MET, I don't think. But there's, 
we've got to design suites and maintenance. So our suites control exactly how the models run in forecast, how it cycles, when it's run, what version it uses. We have to share that with the partners so they're doing the same runs. We have to set that up in a different region and get the right ancillaries in. And that, all that's got to be controlled in some way. And then we've got to have tools where we can visualize the case studies in a way forecasters can use. We've got to take part in test beds and activity like that. There's curb management. Everything's down there. We, we don't underestimate the importance of that. And we don't underestimate the importance of documenting the models. So this is the documentation of our first release of the regional model, which is still under review, essentially. So what are our priorities? I've got about 10 minutes. I think that's probably good. So what are the priorities in regional model development? So this is a Met, uh, the Met Office or the Unified Model Met Office Partners perspective, but many of these are common to other models. Not all of them. This is what's on my list in this role as, as important to me. And I guess the top one is reduce main biases and, and, and deficiencies. So I've just talked about that. We've got to understand them. We've got to prioritise them and we've got to try and bring them down. That's a thing. But another thing, it, that doesn't exist in isolation. So another thing is ensembles that we're looking at at the moment. We've got one of the top lists of priorities for deficiencies is that our ensemble system is underspread. That's come from the forecasters. That's, we don't have metrics that say our, our ensemble system is underspread. They just simply say, we'd rather, we'd rather take the deterministic one and squint. That's better. Um, well, it's not better, but it, we can do just as well by squinting. And I think we use 33% of all our forecasting runs on the, the, the regional ensemble system. So it really has to be a tool that the forecasters believe in or we can demonstrate it's got, got value. So that's a huge priority. And at the moment... It's not so much working out how to improve the model as how to understand what, what you want your ensembles to do and what is it trying to achieve. It's a really big one for us. There. I talk, if people want to talk about that, it'd be great afterwards. It's, it's a big thing. So we run the model away from the UK, and, and so we've started, and, and I know you're well ahead here, but we've been developing a, a kind of what, what they kind of refer to as a warm start system. So this is to one of the... We, and if we're running away from the UK, we've typically what they call cold start would be you just take the global analysis and then run from there. And what you see is a kind of spin up y, spin down y activity going on because there's no convective scale structures in the, in the initial conditions because they've come from the global, which is parameterized convection. So, what, what we need to do is get the, the right kind of smaller scale structures in at the start. One way you can potentially do that in the absence of DA or in the absence of observations is to do something that's a bit DA like. So, you're cycling and then nudging back to, to something that's like the global analysis rather than taking the global analysis. And you can filter on lens scales. And this is one of the big areas Chris is working on and we could talk to people more. I've got a slide on each of these and I'm going to go in danger of going into detail. Uh, improved representation of process we talked about. Next generation is a challenge for me coming forward. I'll get onto that. And better, we've still got to improve the observations to research process, drawing in the forecasters' information and things like that. Just for fun, these are kind of some of the lists. So these, these are the lists of our priorities of the biases and things. Um, so I've got a climate list, which is a bit... Um, in its infancy, let's say, at the moment. So this is, this is quite... We've, it's been dominated by forecasters at the moment complaining about stuff. And I don't always believe them, but we've got to work through this. This is really important for us. They're not always right. They're, they're often wrong. Um, <laughs> but, but you can't ignore it. We've got this list coming from the UN partners, which is a little bit more process-like. And these are the partners that are, say, uh, uh, identifying these challenges for development. And then, as I say, there's this heavy... We've got too much snow reaching the ground in our climate one. It hasn't caused a problem in... The weather runs, and it's not, it's not a thing. But it's, so that's a different priority thing, and where you spot things in climate that are not, not different. But it starts to build up on the ground through winter and things, so you do these 20-year slices. And uh, just to say what we do on ensembles, well, I've touched on this, actually, but just to say what we do on ensembles, we've gone, in a history sense, from 2012, where it was just a, basically a cold start, and we did 12 members, through, through something in between now to where... We have this very complicated diagram here, but essentially that's demonstrating the build-up of ACE three-hourly runs of the lagged ensemble that produces three-per-hour runs of the, that generate then an 18-member lagged ensemble. Um, 
And then, then, but how do you visualize the output of these kind of things? And when you run with a lagged ensemble like this, one of the ways that is becoming very popular with the forecasters looking at it is, is we call them paintball plots because we haven't got many ensemble members. They're sometimes referred to as confetti plots in the US because you've got more ensemble members available to you. And, and, and so you can shade the more recent, for us in, in these, we're using it. You can take some threshold of something that's important to the forecasters. So this is a, a cluster mean probability of three hours rain fall above five mil, let's say. And the darker the, the, darker the uh, pattern, the, the more recent it is in the, in the initialization. So you can see whether you're converging on a solution or something. So that's a really important potential mechanism for visualizing this. And so you can see two things. It turns out it was pretty confident about this area all the time. It was evolving in this area. That's, that's a very basic thing you could already see from that. But there's, there's more in there that the forecasters like. I think I've touched on that. I'm going to skip over, but you know, it's, it's should an ensemble, this is an interesting discussion point, covering the questions, we know the models are not right. We have biases, we have errors, and we have problems, and we make mistakes. You know, should your, what, what we're trying to achieve with an ensemble system, is our ensemble system trying to give a forecast which does its best to get something that might be right, knowing that it's much more overspread than you might want, but it's trying to de deal with problems we just can't deal with? So if we have a systematic bias in shallow cumulus, happen to have a, uh, uh, you know, you could design something that might make that behave in lots of different ways. We know is we can't get completely right still, and it would spread that. Is that what we're trying to achieve, or should we just say, yes, the ensemble members still don't help you, but we're trying to get the model better? That's a kind of question. I think I think the answer is we can't get away with doing that, but it might be the way that made more sense. We really need to do, in this team, we need to do more process evaluation and get down to the processes and things like this. So this is some work of Chris, who's, who's, who's here, and there's, this plot here shows how, how many forecasts. So there was about 100 forecasts tailing off of, uh, with lead time got into this. But this just shows a wind pressure relationship in tropical cyclones. And so I think you're aiming for, you're aiming for this. Our global model's here, and then our regional model's here, so there's a big improvement. But we're falling significantly short of HWAF in terms of these uh, lower pressures and, and, and higher winds. And uh, I think we understand this, and we think we know it's probably related to the way we're doing our boundary layer drag, potentially. Uh, but this is the type of analysis you need to get down to to pin down what you want to change. I'm, I'm showing it kind of more for that, that analysis. I always keeps going up with wind speed, and it's supposed to kind of actually tail off the drag. Um, we need more test beds and field campaigns. So our aircraft's going out to in a, in a year and a bit to uh, Southeast Asia, and it's going to fly transects uh, from here to here, basically. Um, but we're already running a model over here, so we can begin to look at this before the aircraft gets there, try and identify what, what we want in it. Uh, we've been running test beds, so we've been engaging with forecasters in all these different countries, the Philippines and, and, and there, to try and do this. And we're beginning to get, even get them, them to look at the, the processes that are going involved. So we can take cross-sections across our model now and, and begin to think, look at some very basic diagnostics, which is all we've got, because it's really at the infancy of doing this. Uh, you can see the, the terrain on the bottom. Uh, so this is what the global model is giving us, and then we've got the convective scale down the, the right. And you can see the big difference in terms of, let's say, relative humidity with respect to ice, where this convective uh, plume's going through, and, 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 uh, and that's, you know, it's 100% it's saturated through there. And you don't see the same mixing of, you know, influencing of, of the convection scheme when you look at the, the global model on that. And that's got consequences for ice and, and, and other 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 things. You can sort of even zoom in on that and sort of begin to look at, I've only zoomed in by stretching and cutting it on the thing. It's not even a clever graphics thing, this. But you can begin to see the edges of this and things like that, even in the, the, the original plot we had. And so, but, but, you know, I've just thrown these on the slide and we're not looking at them in much detail. And we, you know, it's such a big job. We've got so many different things to do. Get, getting all these things in there is, is a challenge. But if you have a bigger group and you have a comparison and you focus around some of these questions, there's a lot more you could do. OK, I'm nearly done. Uh, I've talked about engaging the meteorologists. 
as they use ensembles, so the way a metrologist uses ensembles ultimately is they've got to understand vulnerability. So you, you, you got to do this in climate as well, but for regional climate modelling, it's pretty much the same activity. You work out what thresholds, where's, where's vulnerable, what's it vulnerable to. That determines how you analyse your forecasts then to work out what you're doing. So the Philippines is possibly a, a very good example. So they're, they're very vulnerable to landslips. So tropical cyclones, although in a lot of regions it's the wind and things like this, are the, the surge, and I know the Philippines had a big surge that killed a lot of people. Quite often it's landslips from heavy rain. It doesn't have to be right in the core of the tropical cyclone. It can be, you know, the rain around the edges of it and things like this. And the northern Philippines particularly vulnerable. So you can choose something, for example, like 200 mil threshold, it, you know, the forecaster should be in control of this if they've got the right tools. And then they can process this, which was a forecast of uh, a tropical cyclone that came over the Philippines in last year or the year before. And it did kill quite a lot of people, actually. Um, but the forecasts were good and they did get advice out, but it was still difficult. That's another topic, another seminar. Um, but you can see these very, very high risk probabilities in the 1900% from the ensemble of over 200 millimetres of, of rainfall. And within that, they'll have regions that they know are particularly vulnerable and can use that. This was an example where the track was highly predicted in accurately as well. But what the global models were able to give in a, as valuable a way as these regional models where you get the value is these high rainfall rates and things like that. Whereas you can get a lot from the track. But the forecasters have got to feed back once they're using that. Once that system's there, we're looking for the forecasters to then feed back and say both how the tools can be developed, but what were the problems in the model, what were the things we should be tackling, and even more than that, you know, how can we do it? Quickly onto the developments in the future. So I've talked about the dynamical core, the next dynamical core is coming in. So it's kind of how I have to do my job. So we've just released this model, RAL, the second version of the model. Um, this year, we know around here we're buying we're buying a supercomputer around here. We're buying another one around here. We don't know how this one's going to work. It's going to be a bit a bit funny probably. So we're, develop, we're developing new code. So it's essentially a new model, but it's a new dynamical core. Uh, it's, that project's well underway. It's been running for about six seven years now to do the dynamical core and re recode. Uh, everything, and we have a, a code generator that uh, will generate different code from different machines. It's a bit like domain-specific language. I know that around this time here, we need a version of the model that's that's ready for that. And around here, I'll, I'll have something that's about ready to try. So I've got to build my release path based on making sure I, we do this, and that's to implement that whole new model. Uh, essentially, the physics will be ultimately the same, but potentially significantly recoded. Um, and so, there's potentially one. I see potentially one or two releases in that time window, and then the question becomes, what what do you put into that? And and that's all in preparing for this. Where this is this is because you know, that's the term Denard scaling, but the, the the chips are changing essentially. John, what's LFRIC. So Elfric, that's the name of that chap. Oh. LF Richardson, that's just the name of the so that's the name of the project and might be the name of the might be the new name for the unified model when it comes in. But it will replace the unified model or it'll be just called the project's been called Elfric. It's, but often projects turn into the model that's name. Similar, yeah. uh, and they called it Elfric after LF Richardson who did this first and recognised the problems with scaling and things by all these people running around. Perhaps talk to this is this just highlights the problem of the warm start that we touched on, but you can t and you can talk to Chris, but this is the cold start. Chris gave me these animations. So you can see this it's building it up and then it goes too big and things it's like a spin up and spin down thing. And this is what happens when we've got the our first implementation of the warm start. So we have a more constant convective scale modeling. And we're doing a lot of work over Darwin, there's a very good radar. So this is another area the UN partnerships comes in. It's tropic tropical convection, but Darwin radar in the tropics, great. What else is on the horizon? Um, there's a multimodal cloud scheme. That's just doing mixing in. It's, it's boundary layer stuff. I'll skip that. Um, Paul Field and Adrian Hill, both of whom work at NCAR, uh, have developed a new microphysics scheme. A lot of work with the aircraft to, to, to develop that. It's got a lot of flexibility, allows user-defined things. We're not big fans of user-defined things in the office. So we'll pin that down when it comes into the modeling system. But the, 
for the research, it can do lots of different things and, and have many different modes and things. And this is ready now. This, this works. This is ready now. But we can't take it into the model. It's too slow. So this is the other thing we have to look at. We have to run, so all those model runs I talked about, everything has to run in a 50-minute window for weather forecasting. You've got a 50-minute window for the model to run five days. And so if they give me a scheme that breaks that, we can't have it. So they've got to get it quicker. And then the big one that um, I touched on we're wait, all waiting for really is, 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 is a scale aware convective closure. So at the moment, we turn our convection scheme off in the, when we're running with a kilometer scale physics. That's not really acceptable because you're quite clearly not resolving it. We rely on the subgrid scheme to do the transport, uh, the subgrid, obviously. Uh, in reality, what we probably need is some kind of scale aware parameterization so we can go smoothly from the 10 kilometer to the 4 kilometer to the 2 to the one. When we've got that, we can make better pragmatic decisions of what grid length we run at. We'll be less constrained. We're a bit nervous of going beyond four kilometres. Four kilometres is kind of theoretically very bad. In practice, OK. Eight kilometres is theoretically very, very, very bad. In practice, sort of OK-ish. But what we really want is, is, is this, where we can make sensible decisions about this. I think, you know, realistically, we want to be running at about a kilometre anyway for all kinds of other reasons. But even to run at a kilometre, we would, we would very much like to have a good convective parameterization in there. I think that's the game changer. The other things that we're working on, I have a group that... Um, the team in Reading are working on urban modelling and we run in real time. We don't call it operational because if it breaks, it needs someone to come in and fix it. So it takes a few hours whereas an operational system is back up in, a, in a less than an hour. Um, but it runs in real time and it's used by the forecasters over London. This is a 300 meter model. Uh, and we also are running a coupled ocean wave, ocean wave atmosphere land, obviously, because it just sits on the already atmosphere land coupled. It's coupled to the ocean and the waves and we're trying to get hydrology into that as well. And we call that UKEP, the environmental prediction model. Um, that's still in research mode for the next few years. I don't see that being operational for a while. We're really exploring what the benefits of that coupling are. It's kind of around multi-hazard storm surge things, I think. It's just a, that's a, just a picture of some, some more on that. It describes where we are. So we just began by coupling with the ocean, then we got the waves in and some higher res resolution. Some challenges around the data assimilation in that as well. And, and the initialization. And on the urban side, one of the things we've been working on is a sort of two canopy scheme for the for London. So if you break London to 300 meters, you can already see this kind of parks and things like that, and getting the exchanges around. I probably haven't got time to tell you about the heat wave now, unfortunately. Um, we ran the model essentially with different SSTs and 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 things, and uh, looked at the impact of local SSTs on on the heat wave. And the long and short of it was that if the SSTs had been a, more like climatology, which was two to three degrees cooler, the maximum and minimum temperatures would have been about one, over land, would have been about one degree cooler. So that, that was the impact of about a three degree local SST on it. Uh, this is, of course, lead time, but just look at this side when it's saturated. And that was over the sea. And then for land, it was more variable because it depended how stressed the soil moisture was in the different regions and things like that. But on average, it could be as big as three degrees, but on average, um, moistening the soils back up to more like climatology gave you about a 0.8 degree cooler uh, temperature. So that it was about about one degree as well. So each the three degrees in the ocean and the, the soil moisture each contributed about a degree. And this was additive. We did the joint experiment to the maximum temperatures. Of course, the land, or not of course, but probably obvious after you've spotted it, the, the, um, the minimum temperatures are not impacted in this. The, the effect on maximum and minimum was the same for the sea temp experiments. For the land, it just mainly impacted the uh, maximum temperature. In fact, it was almost the opposite. Well, it was the opposite sign for the minimum temperatures. Probably because you were putting a bit more moisture in, so there was less cooling at night. But land was important. But land was equally important. And I quote you on that. And you could say that. <laughs> 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 
Okay, so I finished. Let me just wrap up by saying, you know, I believe regional systems are important tools for weather and climate prediction, both now and they're going to remain so. I think that's the main point there. There's, we're not going to get. To, I don't see any time where we get to a point where we don't choose to do some kind of regional modelling, even if we can do global convective scale. And one of the purposes of my team will be to have a global convective scale model, kilometre grid scale model ready. But I don't think you would choose to do that in the absence of regional modelling to get better things. There's loads of things to think about when developing it. I've been through lots. Uh, and you know, you've always got this pragmatic, maybe I didn't touch on this much, but one of the things we're just effectively making a decision about all the time with regional modeling is how you use your HPC. How do you use your computer? Is it for longer lead time? Is it for resolution? Do we have a bigger domain? How many runs do we have? How many ensemble members do we have? Do we couple? How complicated do we want the microphysics and things? All those are going into a big pot, getting swirled around and then being pulled out without much traceability in terms of those decisions and that's really important we've got to work continue for the weather side at least work with the operational meteorologists and perhaps the analogy on the climate side is working with the stakeholders i think essentially that, that have been using the, the climate change information and it's, it's, it's hard right so collaboration is essential eg and care and that's why i'm here thank you Thank you very much, John, for a great talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Okay, Tim. N nice talk, John. Thanks. Thanks. There's an amazing amount of work going on there. So I guess one thing I was wondering about towards the end is you talked about the convective um, uh, scale aware convective parameterizations. I mean, once you get below 10 kilometers, how come you just don't represent it explicitly? Well, um, if you go and look at a cloud, big clouds come out of small clouds, and if you go out and look at a cloud, they're a few metres and then they're a few hundred metres and there. And what, so what you do by not putting it, what you do by having it explicitly represented is you alias it onto a larger scale, essentially. So if you think that you resolve, so I, I don't know whether you notice my language. I'm very careful with my la language sometimes. I never use the term resolution. There's nothing worse than hearing someone describe their grid length as a resolution, um, because clearly you do not resolve, and it's not a measure of the resolution of your model, the grid length. So we run with a grid length of one and a half kilometers or one kilometer. Let's say that's a resolution. Let's say generously four by four you're resolving so that's a resolution of five to ten kilometers by five to ten kilometer grid um, that's but either, either way even if you pretended one kilometer was what you were resolving clouds are smaller than that by not doing that you are doing the transfer wrong we get away with it pretty well that's that was probably the point of you know four kilometers we can run at four kilometers and, and for the metrics we look at we get a lot of answers that we can just get away with but um I think some of the problems we have are because of that and not because we're getting away with it. We're not completely getting away with it. Thanks. Okay, Bert. Okay, thank you, John. Can you comment on your experience with uh, city scale modeling for London? What type of issues had you, you had to deal with in particular? I can say a little. Um, we've been primarily focused on fog in that model. And so... It's so, so in that domain is Heathrow, and fog impacts Heathrow. It's a, so if we give the difference between a good and bad f fog forecast at Heathrow is something like it costs them one point two million pound. That's the difference per day for a, a, a good bad fog because they have to. They can land flights because all the planes that fly into Heathrow can land in fog, but they can't move them around the airport very very well. So it's all about. So they have to slacken off the... And it's, in terms of the use of runways, it's the busiest airport in the world. So going to this higher resolution was to try and capture some of the uh, valleys and things to see whether it improved the fog. Um, I think the answer is it certainly seems to, but it's fog forecasting so hard that it's, it's a kind of delta on not great. We've got a smallish delta on not great with that. Um, the urban stuff that I talked about it is certainly helping with some of the predictions of maximum and minimum temperatures in the cities. We've seen the impacts of parks and things and stuff like that. So, so are you resolving the thermal plume as well for uh, impacting on the fog? 
The what, sorry? The, the, the thermal plume, the relatively, I mean... Uh, but you, you, yes and no. Resolving, <laughs> no. Uh, capturing explicitly, you know, if you're thinking about, if you're talking about pooling of cold air in the valleys and things like that, absolutely, you can see that in the, in the plots and things like that. Whether you're resolving it or not. So, so they did a big experiment with, uh, over the central UK, looking at this, where we, we instrumented a bicycle and they rode around and... and, and uh, <laughs> I think we sent some cars out as well. I happened to show this uh, a couple of weeks ago here as well, for <laughs> Amsterdam, yeah. Right. Okay, maybe we'll take one more question and then uh, break. Any other questions? Rich. Might ask two, actually. When you... Um, so when you move essentially the regional model around the world uh, and you run it, do you make separate decisions about how to tune it or is it, are you pretty strict about... I glossed over that, didn't I? Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, we accidentally, uh, by not being very, very carefully planned have two versions of the model, one for the tropics and one for everywhere else. Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. Um, I regret that. I wasn't involved in the, that happening. I th it, we are where we are now with that. On the development plan is to try and get back away from that. I believe it's possible but difficult. I'm not going to kill ourselves to try and have one version working everywhere, but it's, we, have a, we have what we call a tropic RA1T and RA1M at the moment. So the individual centres make kind of no effort to improve it for their own purposes or they're kind of hands off then say okay whatever you guys decide. We work together on it that's okay. the whole point of that collaboration. Okay. I would say that we kind of control it but they they input into that process and, and, and so it's we kind of manage it because things need managing. We, we're a consortium that where the biggest, the Met Office is the biggest member in, and we, we, we have some, and everyone's happy with that. But yeah, the, 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 the tropic, so the, tropic, the tropical version grew out of a project that was funded, not connected with the UN partnership, which is why I didn't have my hands on it, directly coming into the Met Office from Singapore Met Service. And they kept complaining about its performance, and people kept running away really, really quickly and making changes. And that's not how to develop a model, and that's not going to happen now. And, um, and, and so, there was about eight versions, everyone was going berserk, there was about eight versions released over a year that tweaked the starting point of the middle attitude model into a, into a regional model. And all our partners were pulling their hair out because they were running in the tropics. And were, no, it's a new version, and then next week they were telling there was a new version. It was a disaster. But we are where we are, we can get those together, I think. And if not, we will have two versions. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question, Rich. That's uh, a so really, challenge, yeah, sorry. challenge for all of us. Um, so uh, John will be here for, um, be before we thank him for his seminar, he will be here for uh, the next day and a half. And so NCAR Day is Tuesday, tomorrow. So if you would like to meet with John, uh, please just stay uh, for a few minutes and we'll uh, schedule um, Tuesday uh, visit with John and, 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 and Chris can, as well, who knows how to do everything. Okay, again, Chris. I don't sorry, really know anything. Actually. Chris will answer all the questions that John can't. No, sorry. <laughs> um, and and uh, John is willing to go up to Mesa Lab as well. So, uh, Julio, are you here? No, Julio's not here. He's listening on on the on screen. So Julio might want to meet with you. So, so if, if anybody from CGD or any other lab would like to meet with John, send me an email if you're listening. So uh, let's uh, uh, thank John for a great talk. Thanks. And. Uh